So welcome back to our second discussion today, which um, will as well be our last one of our series of talks during our seminar week with the topic, what is next? Um, as guests for this talk today, we are very happy to welcome Matthias Vollmer and Johannes Repsamen from ScanVision, and Marcus Treadway and Jürg Pulver from Building Point. Um, Matthias Vollmer and Johannes Repsamen, they together founded the ETH spin off ScanVision in January 2018. Johannes Repsam studied architecture and geoinformation systems at the ETH Zurich, whereas Matthias Vollmer studied architecture at the ETH Zurich and film at the ZHDK. ScanVision's work is based on many years of experience with point clouds at the Chair of Landscape Architecture of Christoph Schiro and aims to explore and expand the boundaries of surveying and representation. Their work includes the surveying, documentation, and visualization of art objects, urban situations, large-scale landscapes, underground infrastructures, and many more. Marcus Tretway is the CEO of Building Point since 2018. Um, the company is producing and researching measurement technology and software solutions in architecture to explore new potential for dig digital processes in planning and construction. Marcus Treadway holds a MAS in virtual design and construction and BIM from Fachhochschule Nordwestschweiz and used to be a lecturer for structural and civil engineering CAD and BIM at FHNW and the Bern University of Applied Sciences. Um, we are now very excited to hear a bit more about your work and research and would like to let you start the talk with a short introduction each. Um, would Skadden Vision like to start? Yes, thank you for the introduction and also for the invitation. Um, we're very happy to present here. It's always interesting for us to come back to this ETH context and especially the context of really architecture to talk about um, our work. Um, so let's see if I can handle this, okay screen share okay can you see my screen okay <clears throat> so maybe i just start um so scan vision um as barbara mentioned before is an eth spin-off so one one guy is missing today it's a uh, dennis heisler he's also in the team now of scan vision and we all still work for the chair of landscape architecture of professor giro and that's also the, really the background of scan vision so that's where it all started that's where the laser scanning started in the context of um, landscape actually in the context of landscape modeling and landscape design um, it turned out to be a very useful and powerful method to um, work within the landscape work with vegetation with slopes with water and so on um, so that's why this technology actually arrived um, at our chair or at our institute um, and we thought actually it's a very interesting tool, not just for the design process, but also for the perception and for the representation of landscape. So we all work in the, in the media lab, which is busy with the question of how we perceive landscape and how we represent landscape. And so we started to adapt this technology. And yeah, with ScanVision, we tried to break out a little bit of the context of the ETH and, and um, try to approach also different eras like the art world or the urban scale or different things we will see. Um, yeah, so maybe we just start with a short video. It's a trailer from the from the current exhibition at Einfach Zürich. It's just, it's quite fast cut, but uh, still you get a lot of impressions what we do.
Yeah, so maybe I can, can you still hear me? Yeah, well, Maybe I can already make a few comments because time is short. Um, so this project was about different stories about the city and the canton of Zurich. So we approached uh, this project uh, with different kind of ideas, like uh, what are the key features, for example, that we can actually show spatially um, about the city of Zurich and about the canton of Zurich. Um, so basically the canton of Zurich, but the city obviously is a big important part of the canton. And so we produced different stories about Zurich just with this technology. Uh, one, the last one you just saw was about the industrialization of Zurich, um, showing, for example, the living, the home of a, of a um, company worker from the 18th or 19th century, which has been preserved. And we also showed the water supply of Zurich and also the train station you saw some extracts from, which is very interesting because it's a lot about underground. Um, yeah, and it started actually with the physical model of the Zurich in the 18th century, which we also scanned and scaled up to, to the real size and put it into the video. Okay, so uh, I'm wondering, yeah, now it's going. So I give the word to you, Johannes. Thank you for the introduction. Yeah, just to, as we do not know whether you're familiar with laser scanning or upon clots, we just want to give a short introduction. Actually, laser scanning uses the principle that light is reflected. And uh, you know all these laser measuring devices that you can buy in the do-it-yourself store and have replaced the double meter. Actually, you send a laser beam out and measure the time until it is back again. The distance to the reflecting object can now be calculated via the speed of light. So, yeah, the devices we usually use um, measure between 100 and 200,000 um, points a second and uh, simultaneously are rotating and in the end create a dome of measuring points. And uh, afterwards, uh, photo camera takes overlapping images of the area. And with the color information of the images, um, the measuring points can be colored. So actually what we get in the end is a, is a point cloud colored. And yeah, <laughs> following a short um, video we did years ago, but just to explain um, that it is uh, a point um, with a coordinate x, y, z and color information RGB and then put together to, to models, digital models we can use for whatever application we want to generate in the end. Okay, so the, the second technology we often use is photogrammetry. It's a very different approach of measuring. Um, it's actually the older, the older uh, technology or method to, to measure 3D. Um, it's something we use a lot for smaller objects, as you can see here now. It's, that's the so-called table tish from Fishly Weiss, uh, which we actually made a model of. And it's actually based on a lot of images <laughs> from different positions. So you have to move a lot and photograph the same thing from different angles. And you get, again, um, a point cloud, um, actually a very high resolution point cloud, but you can really approach a very small scale, which is sometimes a little bit tricky with the, with the laser scanner. So we, we really searched uh, the right technology for the right situation. And this can vary a lot. So yeah, maybe photogrammetry is for the smallest scale and then the machine you just saw before the laser scanner is for a bigger, bit bigger scales and and then there are different laser scanners that go much further and we use for the bigger landscapes and yeah we end up with the uh, airborne lidar but maybe johannes will mention that again just in a minute 
just go on. So the following series of pictures is the work we made for the magazine Arc Plus, in which we try to show the full potential of the qualities of palm cloud technology. Actually, the, the image we were looking at is uh, shows the connections in the water system of the Engadin power stations. And uh, here, actually, we put together different data sets um, from Italy, uh, Italian national data, then Swiss national data from Swiss Topo. And um, on the very hot spots, we, we uh, worked at the retention lake Puntalgal and over spin, um, yeah, we used uh, terrestrial laser scanners. And actually what's, yeah, the, the nice thing for us is that in the end we have a large digital model we can look at from wherever we want and generate images afterwards. So actually this is not um, an auto photo or uh, an image taken by an airplane, but it's, uh, it's an image taken in a digital model. And maybe yeah, to, to go a little further on, um, this, this image shows that actually we have to put together different scan positions. So here the colors are standing for, um, each color stands for the scan position because actually the scanner is only recording what you would as well see if you would be in the, the very position of the scanner. So the, this means that there are shadows and to, to create an overall model, you have to do several scan positions to, to get a complete model. And then actually what we are fascinated about these models is um, that they have a certain quality of an, an ephemeral quality. Um, the transparency um, with which we can show actually above and underground infrastructures within the topology, topography we're working. At. And yeah, as, as Johannes mentioned, it is actually in the end, it is a 3D model. So that means that we can also edit it. So that's something we also really like to use. You saw it before in the, in the video. So the section uh, is becoming important again. Um, also in 3D, it's a really good tool to show relationships and also to show different scales um, in one image. So you can really show the same. I mean, this is like, it's higher than the prime tower at this point. And this is maybe you can somehow guess the human scale down here. So these are actually some of these methods we use are actually also you can find in the classic architectural drawings. But then again, it's it gives you a very different impression as this point cloud has a very unique um, way of showing things like with the transparency and also with the different scale, you can just easily record and show. And then we can also go inside, obviously. Um, so this is a very different scale to what we just saw. It's a classic indoor picture, actually. Um, still, we retain actually this kind of transparency. So we can guess what's, we can still guess what's around us. We can see different layers of architecture that are in this, within this space. And then finally, we can also um approach this really eye level human scale um narrative when we look at uh, at um like in a first person view at the at the spaces and in this case it's also a mix uh, of laser scanning and also photogrammetry what you can see here in these brown patches this is actually made by some eth students that were just very interesting in this process of the water dripping over the concrete for for many, many years and creating these very unique patterns. Yes, and uh, since point clouds are static models that often only show a certain moment in time, we usually work with supplementary surround sound recordings that on one hand bring temporality into play and on the other hand clarify the spatiality and materiality via the sound.
And now we actually we're actually kind of through. We just wanted to show you a very, very fresh work. It's still in production, but it's interesting, I think, because it shows a lot of different different aspects that we were talking about. Can you see the screen? Yes. yes. So this is where we have been uh, two days ago um, in Canton Bern in the mountains. And we've been scanning there for, for a few years. So from, from time to time, we go up there and, and scan some of this infrastructure. It's a huge hydropower um, system. Uh, now you can actually see whenever a raindrop comes down in this area that you see now, it ends up in this kind of system of a KVO. So they have a lot of pipes and stuff on the ground. And this is now it's not a movie, it's an app. So we think it's really interesting to have this kind of interactivity. But I'm not sure if it <laughs> if it works if I'm full screen. I'm sorry. Okay, there we go. So this idea of showing different scale in one model is something that is really interesting for us. And we think it's also important, especially in this case, because you will now understand that for you, it's easy to understand where is Handek, for example, what you're looking at now um, in relation to, for example, the Gelmersee, which is up here, and also to understand how the water is actually transported within, within the system. Um, oh, yeah, one of the most interesting things are probably the underground um, infrastructures. I'll just go forward there because our time is basically up. Um, so the idea was really also to understand how the system also underground works. So we can go to this hydropower stations underground. They are usually underground and also approach them again on a kind of architectural human level, actually. Yeah, so maybe now I can zoom out and then you will actually hopefully understand a little bit uh, just about the situation of Grimsel 1 in relationship to the Hospice, which is just over there, and in relation to the big, the big lake. Yeah. Maybe you want to add something, Johannes, or should we go, should we finish? I think we just, uh, yeah, we, yeah, at the moment we, we try to push a little these these applications uh, which are interactive um, because yeah they they guide a little with this uh, constant movement and give a good overview, but on the other hand leave yeah the the user uh, certain freedom to to move and to to look at the yeah the different organizations and uh, relations from facilities to each other to the topography and yeah. yeah i think we're through um, thanks for your attention so far thank you very much for your presentation that was very important to see. Um, Marcus and Jörg, do you want to continue? Oh, you're muted, actually. Can you have everybody hear me and see my screen? Yes. Great. Thank you very much, Matthias and Johannes. Uh, very impressive, very, very great uh, usage of point clouds there. Awesome. Uh, so Jürgen and I are going to give you a quick overview, more from a technology point of view and also from a, from a usage point of view, uh, what's going on uh, with uh, point clouds on our side. Who are we? Um, as persons, um, we already have introduced Jürg, he is a, he is a geomatiker, so a, a surveying engineer, and uh, he has uh, a decade of experience with laser scanning too. Basically, everybody knows him in Switzerland. And we work for the MEB group. We work in uh, different companies. He is more on the geospatial side, which is the company Alnaf, and I work for the Building Point. But um, together, uh, we formed uh, the unit of uh, roughly 130 people. We also have uh, 
surveying engineers in the field day by day that work in Tel Aviv. You can see them around Zurich there all the time with their cars. You can see them. So we are down to practice and um, not somewhere flying around. Um, all of the building point, we are um, support and uh, sales organizations. Um, we work very closely with Trimble in that aspect. Trimble is a global player. Uh, Trimble, however, is not, um, we are not Trimble. We work with our customers. Um, we are not on the stock market. They are. Um, they invest a lot in technology, so it's not interesting to buy stocks just in any case because they invest it back. They don't uh, give it to you. Uh, a lot of people work for Trimble over, over the whole planet in several segments from agriculture, from uh, geospatial, uh, to transports, uh, civil engineering, structural engineering, architecture, and um, over 100 million users use our technology. And in the last years, uh, Trimble has um, gathered uh, a lot of very smart companies underneath one roof. I'm sure you guys know Frank Deary, um, world star architect. He also uh, is part of Trimble since roughly uh, five years now. And um, Trimble does not buy these companies just to, to buy companies. They buy them to transform the way the world works. And I'm sure that laser scanning, that's one of the key assets uh, where uh, research and development, development is going on. Um, I think what is important and that was already in the introduction is not taking a deep dive just on laser scanning. Obviously we will do that today, but I think the holistic approach um, of uh, connecting various use cases around the building uh, from the conceptual phase to the planning phase, construction phase, demolition phase, and all the way back um, requires um, obviously teamwork, but uh, from a technology point of view, it requires a constructible model, uh, models that we use in the field that we bring back to the office for planning and um, scanning there obviously is a key asset to connect the digital and the physical world together uh, to keep it always up to date too, because to automate a lot of things, scanning is kind of the prerequisite. So we're going to look at scanning today, um, and we already heard a lot, we already saw a lot of uh, point clouds and obviously um, capturing uh, the, the built environment, uh, that is very obvious use case for uh, laser scanning. Uh, we decided to add some more use cases just to, to widen the horizon a little bit, what else you could do with uh, point clouds or what else uh, customers in Switzerland or on the planet are doing with uh, point clouds. And I think one a very nice example just over, uh, the, over the, the border in Germany is a pedestrian bridge out of timber and steel. Uh, what they did here is they scanned the whole environment and they planned directly the, this timber bridge inside the woods. So they didn't do traditional measuring or something. Uh, they used the point cloud as a basis to position the bridge inside of the woods. And uh, I think that's from our architectural point of view, very interesting um, because you save a lot of time and you actually have the, the real surrounding and it's not just some trees, it's the real trees that are actually there. And uh, obviously this model is a steel model that has been used for fabrication and also erection. Uh, one of the zero drawing projects our customers have uh, day by day. Um, another, more simpler use case is a renovation. Uh, that's, uh, we are living in a built environment, 50 to 60% of what we do in planning and building is renovation and capturing and analyzing the data, how are the walls still vertical? Um, what, are the, what is the material that has been used? Those are things where laser scanning in combination with panorama pictures can uh, really help. And obviously, you don't always work in the point cloud. You can also derive 2D sections and stuff like that. Um, during construction, um, we see a lot of momentum on the MEP side. So basically before installing the whole MEP um, systems, uh, they, they do a scan to make sure that the bearing structure uh, or the existing structure uh, is what it was planned and they check back if the pipes actually fit there. So using a, a point cloud as a classic clash detection 
during building to make sure that uh, like facades, MEP pipes, or also precast elements uh, actually fit because that there are some terrible examples where um, precast has been done uh, on a facade level in California where the planning was more accurate than actually the building will also always happen and that's where laser scanning comes in to make sure that all these additional traits that need to orient themselves to another trade uh, are precise and this is a very nice use case MEP pipes steel uh, columns how to bring it into place during construction uh, other use case during construction, uh, we see that more and more taking up momentum on the in situ concrete site um, is flat floor analysis. Uh, we usually dripped water uh, on the concrete just to see is, is it actually flowing off. Uh, obviously with a laser scan today during construction, uh, people, uh, we know that the quality uh, is as what it has to be or not and then still can correct. This is becoming very common, particularly in the States, uh, to do a flat floor analysis scan during uh, pouring concrete, actually, to make sure that the, everything is where it has to go. Uh, customers in Switzerland, what they often do is uh, they scan before they pour the concrete to have the real documentation of the, the building, um, particularly when you have uh, cable laid bridges like postension stuff there, postension slabs or also complicated MEP situations like you see on some of these print screens. Uh, they scan before they pour concrete or they scan before we hide it from an architectural point of view, just to keep the maintenance cost low. Because obviously when you need to know what is going, been going on here, uh, then the, 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 uh, the facility managers don't need to take off protections or meet, don't need to make drills. It's just documented. And that is uh, very popular at several customers of ours that they uh, scan before they hide stuff or they pour it in. Um, I think uh, Matthias and Johannes did a great job in explaining how a laser scanner actually works. Um, yeah, you work outside, you send the scanning point, then it saves the points, brings them back. Uh, he, he is rotating and it creates also panorama picture. And I think what, what also has to be, to be talked about when we start using point clouds in the field, traditional scanning means you scan outside, you come back to the office, then you analyze the whole point cloud, takes several hours normally, and then you come back to site eventually. And uh, the new generation of scanners, they're able to do the whole process in the field. So they can scan in the field, they can stitch all the point clouds together and actually have a full we call that registered scan already in the field. And like that, uh, our customers are able to do flat floor analysis and stuff like that directly in the field. They don't need to come back to the office. And that just makes scanning so much more accessible to, uh, to a lot of people. It's not just a specialty utility. It's uh, becoming more and more uh, commodity that, that uh, non-geospatial guys know how to do scanning. How do you do that? Very easy, little movie. So you can basically see the scanner, he is uh, walking with it around. He has his tablet where he sees exactly what's going on, where he's doing the scanning, they're all connected with each other. Uh, the scanner, the new generation is able to do automatic leveling, automatic calibration, uh, no need to bring it into warranty or something. And they can do comparison directly in the field because software uh, running on the tablet uh, is able to combine the models and the scan cloud, the point clouds directly in the field. And like that, uh, get this basically sorted directly outside. So there's a certain chance that the foreman, the polier in Swiss German, uh, will be doing stuff like this in the not far future. Uh, we already have customers doing that in Switzerland. Others do it in, in, in other countries or in the States. And um, the, the target is to make it as easy as possible to build outside uh, and make sure that quality is as it was, 
Nothing else is more frustrating than a building that is not where it should be or walls that are placed where it should not be. And that's where tools like this uh, come in to help uh, that uh, precision is increased in the field. So that's a short movie. Um, then from an architectural point of view, uh, obviously capturing data in the field, um, using it in the field, sometimes you'll do it, sometimes not, depends on your role in the future. Uh, what all of the architects I'm sure know is SketchUp. Um, it's a very common tool. Um, most of the students have it on their computer, I'm sure. And SketchUp is actually able to cope with a heavy load uh, point clouds. So here I have a little um, scan. Uh, the, that was done in some states. And um, so we're gonna now take the scan to SketchUp. And in SketchUp, there are tools called uh, the Scan Essentials where you can bring in point clouds. This is still real time. And this is not real time anymore. So the, the, here the movie has been accelerated. Um, obviously, arc, from an architectural point of view, point clouds have too much information. So a certain abstraction, the white, uh, the white models, uh, things I'm sure you use, um, you can directly model on top of the point cloud. And like that, create a more abstract model or a very precise model. Uh, this is something uh, that uh, um, scan services do also in Switzerland. They uh, use SketchUp to model it up very fast. Um, and then the unit building is uh, uh, here. The nice thing is combine the model with the scan. You saw that colory picture before. That's basically comparing is the model exactly where the, uh, where the scan was. So like that, you have a checking ability to make sure it's accurate um, and for everyone actually. So uh, scanning today is not something for experts. It's uh, becoming more and more for uh, normal people. And Jörg is gonna tell us a little bit more about uh, 3D laser scanning uh, with, a, with, a, with a hand scanner. Yes, thank you, Marcos. Yeah, the, in the presentation before we saw this static scanner. So they're normally on a tripod. This means they are really accurate, but not so flexible or not so fast as handheld scanner. And on the next few slides, I would like to tell a bit more about these handheld scanners. Yeah, the example we see here on the right side is the GeoSlam scanner. This is uh, based on the SLAM technology. This means we really can walk through a building. This scanner is rotating, captures some points and also uh, make so many iterations and build up the, the point cloud during during the walk through the building. And on the left side in the video, we also see uh, how it works. It's really, um, you can hold it in the hand. In the backpack, you have a, a data logger, a small uh, computer with a hard drive to store all the data. And you really can just walk through without uh, control points or anything else. You don't need GNSS coverage, just walk through and all the data are captured. And there are also some, um, some newer models where you can see the point clouds already on a tablet computer that you already can check in the field if you really capture everything you want and if it also fits, if it looks as, as it should. Yeah. Yeah, I really think the, the big advantage of this technology is that you are really fast in capturing the data. So you really can walk through and you get uh, this dense point cloud. And you are also really flexible because you can walk behind um, some objects. And if you are uh, measuring in a, in a building, you can go behind the furniture or on the top of the furniture. And these are, yeah. These are things that they are really difficult with static scanners. So yeah, this is a pass, a normal pass, of how you capture a building or a floor. So you really just walk through to, through all the, the rooms, all the offices. And if it's possible, then it's good to close the loop on the on the same on the same point as you started. Then the software can make an adjustment of the whole point cloud so you get the more accurate point cloud in the end. And 
And maybe next slide. This is an example from, from our office here in Okmarsingen. It's actually where I'm sitting now. Um, it's about 20 rooms, uh, 530 square meters, and the time to capture this, this floor plan or this, this, um, this building was really about 10 minutes. So I think if you do it with a static scanner, you need at least, I don't know, two, three hours or even more to capture this. And then, yeah, to draw the maps, it took me a bit longer, maybe yeah, three or four hours. But yeah, in the end, we can say in half a day, we have, we have a really accurate for floor plan with this solution. So we're going to jump over the drones. Obviously, uh, I'm sure you can imagine how this works. And uh, because we would like to give you a quick outlook and things that are about to come. You see on our menu uh, that on the right hand side, there is something like this little robotic down here. And uh, I'm sure you heard about Boston Dynamics and companies like that. And they have announced a strategic uh, partnership with Trimble this week. And all the scanners we saw, they still need human interaction. Um, there's a strong probability that in the future, um, we will not need the human to do the capturing because this can be automated with uh, robotics. This is where research is at the moment. And uh, yeah, the dog actually, it, it's product ready. So these things are not like in five years, uh, these things are uh, around the corner actually. That uh, would we end with spot right on the spot. <laughs> Thank you very much. That was really super interesting. Um, I'll hand over to our group of students who um, prepared a few questions for you. Um, hello, everybody. I'm Manu. Um, we are going to ask you some questions, but first of all, thanks very much for this very impressive introduction and this very good insight of what we can do today in measuring space. Um, from our side, um, we had this week um, in a, pr a previous presentation, um, a quote from Cedric Price and I will read it right now. Technology is the answer, but what was the question? So we use this uh, quote as an introduction to start um, what we would like to, to ask you. So um, what questions are you answering through technology? And how are your service ex services exceeding over the pure fascination of technological advancements? How is your work contributing to a broader improvement of our society? That's a very good question. Well, 
um, I'll go ahead if that's okay, guys. Uh, I would say technology um, itself, as you said, it's technology for technology's sakes. We don't have to do it. But if you look at uh, the loss of uh, roughly 20 to 30% of people in the AEC industry, at the same time, we're building more buildings. It's a very easy question. Who, how can we increase efficiency because we have fewer people to work? And if technology can't cover that, uh, at the moment, there are no other alternatives. So in, at, ultimately, technology has to help increase efficiency and um, fill that gap of people that are not around for construction uh, and for planning either. And that's probably the, a huge gap we have, not just here in Switzerland, we have it all over the planet. And like that, our technologies like these help to increase efficiency. And on a broader scale, obviously we heard that about spot. Uh, the guys in the States don't have to fly around uh, anymore all the time. And that is, uh, I think, a very fair contribution uh, to our environment that we don't have to uh, go to the job sites all the time, uh, that we could basically do it from the home office. Um, so we can have a better environment and also our children's that they don't uh, grow up with masks at the end of the day because our pollution is so bad already today. Maybe um, um, you guys from Scandinavian, do you have other, also something to add? Yeah, I'm uh, actually, first of all, I'm, I'm happy to hear that when you talk about technology, I'm, I'm addressing this to the students and um, that you actually do, do ask this question, whether, whether mm -hmm. what the question uh, was for the technology, because for me, I think it's a very important question. I'm, I'm uh, already, uh, maybe you probably, you know, from your research already, Hannah Arendt um, asked this question um, about whether we should have discussed this in, in our society, whether it's good to have a nuclear bomb or not. I was never discussed. So I think the discussion about exactly this question is very important. Um, and in terms of point cloud, it's, it's a bit funny that actually the question for point cloud, there was a question for point cloud, um, but that wasn't, that, the, the, the answer wasn't actually to visualize it. And so our approach for this technology is actually, we are actually misusing it. So the original idea of the point cloud and the laser scanning was a bit different. It was about measuring and about calculations. And so we, we took actually this debris of, uh, of information to create something that we think is beautiful. So for us, maybe it's not so much about uh, whether this technology should be um, developed or what technology should be developed, but it's maybe more about how can we use the existing technology for something that's maybe not meant to be. So that's um, something that we are discussing a lot. Yeah, maybe Johannes wants to add something. I don't know. Yeah, it's not, I think, not, not just all about speeding up or getting more efficient, but as well to, to, to get better quality in what we're doing in, in uh, maybe as well in the design process. I mean, and what we are using the point clouds for is, is still a model where we actually can prove what we are designing and what we are planning. And, and a model which is, is quite um, an accurate model compared to other digital models um, we usually use or we, we have been used. Um, I mean, um, 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 generated models, not measured models, and especially for landscape and plants and topography, um, we can provide um, yeah, a more accurate or a, a model which, which the human being can get nearer to, I think, and yeah, to prove his um, inputs or his, uh, his um, inserts in, into the 
and to the to our surroundings we're living. Absolutely, I think that's a key element with uh, that to to increase quality in a lot of environments uh, during construction or in the built environment. Uh, you need accurate information, and um, if you look at the the work that has been executed in the field, um, a lot of stuff is rework because it was not planned accurate enough, and that goes to a root, root cause because the captured environment is was not captured precise enough. So it's kind of a domino effect. Uh, and um, I think that's very important to also keep in, in mind that, um, that uh, if you really want to build accurate or manage accurate, uh, accurate data capture is absolutely important. Totally agree with you, Ramos, on that. Hello, everyone. I would also um, have another question for you guys. Um, this one would be for Markus. Um, and I think it connects very well to what you just said. I think what your company does is it makes things much more precise, right? So we knew before how certain measurements should be, but now we know how they actually are. And I'm um, interested in this notion of control, which is like, um, which we are now able to create. Um, and I would also, I'm also interested to see where the limits of this control could be. So I would like to ask you, you whether, like what, what aspects on architecture you consider controllable and whether there are also aspects that exceed themselves from the notion of being controlled. Mm -hmm. Very good questions. Um, I think from a, from a technology point of view, you saw that in the very impressive uh, point clouds uh, Matthias and Johanna showed, we, we are there where large data uh, is more a question of is the software architecture built correctly. Uh, so large data that is solved. Five years ago, that was basically not solved. And um, what the current limits are is this kind of fully automatically creating a BIM model out of a point cloud. Uh, research is going in that direction. There's several startups that are trying to interpret uh, the point cloud. We also have softwares that do that, but um, at current state, that is, it's a point cloud and still needs human interpretation. So there is a limit today in that area. Um, research is going there. And I think at the end of the day, what, what, what nobody can take away is creativity. Uh, what do you do in the built environment? Uh, that's why you guys study architecture. I have a very hard to match for me uh, that computers will automate uh, creativity in the future. I can see it downstream in production or construction, but uh, creativity is something uh, that is uh, very human and that will not be probably able to be taken by technology and should not be able. Thank you for your answer. Um, as you just said about how we can act in this field of this model of the reality that we documented, I wanted to ask Matthias and Johannes about how they represent the reality. In your work, you suggest a close relationship to reality through its precise location of data points. At the same time, it's a representation model defined by a frame that limits the entirety of inter information to a specific observation horizon. You they thereby take a conscious decision on what to show, how to frame it, and also what to leave out of your images. How do you decide on where to set those boundaries? And also maybe, is there a political component in this decision of visibility and invisibility? You're muted, guys. We don't hear you. Okay, one of us has to start. Um, yeah, it's a it's a interesting observation you make. Yeah, you're right. It's always as soon as you start to frame something, you're also guiding and you're also controlling what uh, the observer sees and what he perceives. And for us, this is obviously a very interesting tool to uh, to give you a certain experience of something. And yeah, you're right. It's as soon as you do this, you you're doing political decision in a way that you show things that you want to show and that you hide things that you want to hide. Um, but I guess this is for every visual or audiovisual media the same case, right? So it's 
it's you you become a decision maker and that's something we do and that's also something we want to do because for us the point cloud you're right it shows the reality but the reality is a very uh, maybe difficult word so it's reality um <clears throat> because the point cloud is also not so much the reality as you might think um it's interesting because it looks like the reality it's um, mistakenly sometimes for the reality but also a measurement device has its borders also the precision is not always there also we already decide what we scan and what we don't scan um, so there it already starts so i guess for us this is a very interesting discussion between um, showing what's there and people thinking that this is how it is and also we like to show things how they are and then on the other hand we are well aware that we whenever we start to scan something we already start to highlight something or to cover something or like this kind of chain of decision starts as soon as we start to, to scan and um, yeah that's something we think about a lot obviously and this really depends on the question that we have for a space so we approach a, a place or a space or whatever it is with a certain idea of what we think about it and then also this is also followed by the question what we want to show about it right and yeah uh, thank you for the answer. We also have a question um, which is directed to both of you guys and to both of uh, your companies. Um, because today we have the unique opportunity that we have uh, two companies here with very different scales, sort of. We have the big player who's already existing for like decades now, and we have the very young startup on the other side. And we are interested in where you sort of see um, the the other position and what what kind of unique insights or opportunities you have for your, from your perspective and whether there's also something you can learn maybe from the other side. And uh, maybe Markus, uh, maybe you could start. I, I would always have to start. <laughs> well, obviously I think what Matthias and Johannes are doing, um, th that is they're using the technology in a very, very smart way. Um, they're helping decision-making processes. And uh, I think that is something that is um, very, very critical also as a startup uh, to, to understand the, the value proposition, um, what you, why you actually sell, because a point cloud, you actually don't sell because you sell the, the um, at the end of the day that the people can get, get transparency, get to understand the environment, get to build more efficient, get to take decisions. And uh, I think that, uh, you guys did a very uh, good job on that and uh, you're using a lot of different technology because obviously there is not one technology that is able to sort it out on its own and um, we need people like you to get the point clouds in the hands of, um, of, of more people obviously because um, yeah at the end of the day uh, it's kind of public knowledge too if you look into other countries like up north um, Public authorities have mandated companies like you uh, to create point clouds of the whole environment, and they are accessible through public URLs um, for anybody up there. And in that aspect, there are huge chances uh, for you as a startup to uh, to sell your services in the future. Obviously. Actually, I was very fascinated about this this uh, robot dog, and maybe this is what we what we like about you, the, the, the global players, that you have the yeah the money to to put into research, which um, yeah um, takes the, the technology further on. And actually, sometimes I would really like to have this dog because uh, it goes into these tunnels and underground systems. I'm not really um, want to be the whole day, um, but as well show show it in the end in the model. But on the other hand, I'm glad that sometimes I, I can go outside to to these um, amazing um, alpine uh, environments to yeah to to have the the sublime of, of of nature and surroundings because this is actually something yeah we are coming from we. At the ETH, we provide these um, elective courses where we go to 
sides um, we think it's it's um, necessary to to care about like glaciers or as we showed uh, dams and retention lakes and power systems uh, which we really have to think about in, in the future what what we want how we want to deal with all these these infrastructures and which makes us think about uh, as well um, where the energy comes from we are using it in our everyday life so actually yeah this is maybe as well um, something about the political component we we anyway show whether we, we want or not but um, yeah we try to to go to sites and to to um, have have emotions and uh, as well um, maybe we, we talk with people working there with, with uh, inhabitants in these places and, and then make a representation uh, from this site and, and uh, yeah think think about further on thank you for this very rich inputs and then the next question also to matthias and johannes I wanted to ask is about um, how we, we want to question also how we draw plans and our, how we look at plants because your company is working with a very distinctive way of deception that is different from the traditional tools of architects that we're using also still now partially but it's still changed and we're interested in finding out how your search for this new aesthetic could also change our um, understanding of plants. Have you thought about that? Um, yeah, I think so. I think so. Yeah, we we discussed this from time to time. Um, that we also, I mean, we are also architects in the end, and we also tried out already how to um, draw a design with point clouds, and this actually has led to a very interesting symbiosis between um, drawings and uh, point cloud representations. So, in the end, I think in the future, and I guess all of you already feel that that we're going to draw in 3d um, the 2d is actually just for the printing or for understanding but the actually design will happen in 3d sooner or later and there the point cloud comes in very easily um, this is already very doable all the um, design software is already prepared for point clouds and you can import and use them in there and yeah, that has actually actually has led to this question: How, to, for example, how do we show the landscape surrounding the site? And with the lasers, with the laser scanners, or with the point cloud, we already have a very nice representation of that, and it's already there. You already designed within this kind of environment, and then you just use it actually as a as also as a representation of your environment. And this, yeah, obviously leads to new forms of. Um, of drawings, let's call it still, let's call it drawings, yeah. Did that answer your question? If that's okay, I would like to extend uh, some information here from, from other customers that are in Switzerland, like a customer called Metabau. Um, they don't do any drawings anymore, only for building permission. Um, the whole execution side of things, status quo today, does not need drawings. Technology is there uh, where people can use models on site and get rid of drawings. Um, this is not a trend. This is uh, basically more current state uh, also in other countries uh, like the Hinkley project in France uh, with power plant built with zero drawings uh, or bridges up in the Nordics, very complex geometries built with zero drawings. And I think um, Laser scanning actually accelerates that process, uh, particularly in the, the built environment. So that customer Metaba, um, they do a, a laser scan and then they start their architectural concept on top of it, get building permission with some drawings and, and they take the model to site and stake it out and laser scan to make sure everything is there where it is. So that is something that is a reality for customers of ours today. Obviously not all of them, uh, but um, this is doable today from a technology and also process view. Uh, increase of time may be interesting. They save 50% of their planning time uh, and can actually invest that 50% uh, 
drawing production time into better constructions and reduction of CO2 and stuff like that. Thank you. Um, I have again a question for both of you. Um, both of your professions obtain huge amounts of data within your work that give us access to new perspectives on space that we wouldn't have gotten otherwise. What do you think about the statement data equals money? Maybe Marcus, you can start <laughs> or yeah. Well, uh, as we see, I think Matthias, you agree, data, if it's not structured and interpretable, it's absolutely useless. And the laser scans just make it very, very, very obvious. We collect uh, so much data, um, but bringing it into a shape that is understandable in a structured way, then we call it information. Before it's data, yes, but um, really valuable is information. And um, Personally, yes, if you look at Facebook and all these companies, yes, obviously information has a value. I think the society today is not really yet able to define the value of uh, information. And data is the baseline, yes, but it's absolutely um, useless if it's not brought to a structured information. Yeah, I think I somehow agree on that, uh, but also you could say, Maybe data is uh, or information, and that's what a point cloud is. It's just information. Usually, is also means also power, especially geo geo information means power. That's also the original purpose of of geo information, um, and therefore it comes down to power comes down to money and so on. So what Marcus just explained, right? Um, but still, I also agree uh, with Marco said, I think the use of the data is actually the key to whether it comes to money or not. I mean, it's, you can use data in very different ways and whether it's really financially interesting is it, it depends on, um, what it shows, right? What's in the data, but from, I mean, from our perspective, data should be open source in general. Um, because we profit a lot from all open source uh, data and we think that data, especially when it's uh, concerning the public space, yes. should also go back to the public and should yeah. not be mainly used for making money, let's say, let's call it like this. And yeah, and maybe that's also something um, <laughs> now that Marcus and Jürg are here, that's something we can address to them. I mean, we are very happy that we can use certain machines and the more uh, open system these are, the more we can actually use them. So I think data, but also technology um, should be, if it should be uh, in the use for the uh, society, then it should be an open framework somehow where you can where you can use everything, where you can dive in, where you can profit from different resources. And I guess this would make uh, data actually very valuable, but also very accessible for, for everybody. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, 100% agree. I think uh, the Nordics, uh, particularly Finland, is a, is a great example. I mean, we're not going to get to smart cities or all these nice buzzwords if uh, the public data is not available to, to society. And uh, there are amazing examples around Helsinki, uh, what, what is going up around up there. And those are initiatives that um, obviously if they're brought to a global scale, um, will give the power back to the people basically. Because today uh, you, when you go to practice, I'm sure some of you are draft, drafting people. Uh, you always have to run around and gather. Oh, uh, and then you need to get the pipes from the from the Swiss com. Then you need to go over there, and that information has to be available to the public. And um, I think that is something that has to happen. And I think will happen in Switzerland too. It's more political uh, situation, I would say, um, than a than a technology point of from a tech point of view. Obviously, from a tech point of view. The file structures and all that stuff should be open, open data and not just readable by one supplier from the market that is uh, that's very closed. And um, I think that's where initiatives like building smart open BIM and all that stuff is very, very important. And we also support that uh, heavily. It takes also pressure from us to build everything. 
um, we will live in connected uh, societies in the future and connected software and stuff like that has to has to follow obviously or it has to be there already today could i just ask a follow-up from that um because you mentioned i mean it's come up it came up in our blockchain discussion as well this idea of smart cities but it didn't go very far um a few semesters ago we had a urban theme diploma uh which was based on a real project by sidewalk which is this google uh part of google which is to do with urbanism in smart cities and it was this huge site on the toronto waterfront and it was and the reason it was set it was super interesting what the students uh, did with the project but it was set because it was actually so terrifying the way google framed the project and they've subsequently withdrawn from the project because they'd they had an option on this enormous site where they basically told Toronto that there would be no regulatory oversight from the municipality. It would all be done by Google. And for Google, what the smart city meant was really uh, data harvesting. Uh, data harvesting, which then through various mechanisms and algorithms would be used to somehow track and then satisfy the desires of the inhabitants of the smart city and they were very very open about it it was really truly terrifying um but you brought it up marcus and i i think what's really interesting the, the context that you brought it up in and what matthias was also talking about was in terms of what data what technologies should be open source and obviously a country like finland it has a very different impetus than google does so i'd be really interested to hear both teams talk about what the smart city means because you're describing in a super smart way our environment and actually both of you are involved then in in, in either supplying or transforming that description into modifications of the environment you know, new buildings new landscapes even new ways of looking at the landscapes in the city so what to you is a smart smart city presumably a more benevolent one than the google one <laughs> what else you want to go take the lead or, or maybe you honest or i don't know should yeah, i be honest that's right for you honest there is no wrong answer on this one <laughs> so I, I think smart city is a is a a word that has been around for some time and it's and as you mentioned adam it's uh, uh, the interpretation is very different um and i'm not sure what to think about smart city also because the definition is for me very unclear um but in recent discussion also with the city of zurich um one thing that came up more and more is actually the question about not this, whether a city should be smart but whether a city should be responsive and i guess that also goes in the same direction that you just mentioned so that um the information is one thing but then actually the what do you do with the information so what how do you react on information that's actually the maybe the more interesting part of actually the the smart city so the the smart city should be a responsive city and then the question is who can who's responding to who and i guess in the end it all for me it all comes down to some kind of um uh, maybe a democratic and open source approach to all of this so a smart city should be a city where information is actually available for everybody and where it can be used for projects like architecture uh, which again should contribute actually to our social life in the city so therefore they kind of give a, a response to an information that is there so for me that would be a, a smart city right where every citizen can actually make use of the data that is collected but can also respond on it and and create maybe a discussion about something so that would be for me that would be a smart city in terms of this kind of in terms of the urban discussion maybe so um smart city meaning um smart inhabitants no because i think the most important is that we educate people that they can use this data um, because yeah we made several um, um, 
uh, yeah, interactions where we, we found out that there is data, but um, people cannot use it. They, they do not know how to use it. And this is, I think, the most important if you, if you want to give back um, the data or the freedom, because, um, yeah, if data is open, open government data, but inhabitants and students and professors and architects are not able to use it, then it's only, um, yeah, only companies will use it. So this is the mo most important, I think, um, with new, to new technologies in general that we, we educate people to, to be able to, to control it, to use it. Okay, thank you very much for the answer. I would have another question for Johannes and Matthias, which is that you guys are part of ETH spin-off, which is um, supported by the ETH foundation, right? And I wanted to ask you, how is it in your case different to be supported through an institution instead of a company? Like for instance, uh, does the ETH have certain shares of your company? Do you have to give them certain numbers or is it more open? It's uh, it's actually quite open. I mean, it's uh, when you talk about support, we we don't get financial support from the ETH. Just to clarify that, to begin with, um, <clears throat> yeah, I guess the the main idea of ETH spin-off is really that you can transfer your know-how into something you can do outside of the ETH, and and therefore it's it has been quite useful for us because the ETH is our working environment still is or at least has been before we started the spin-off and with this kind of uh, spin-off um, contracts uh, we are able to just uh, continue our work within the infrastructure that we have been use using before and that is a, a big help obviously so you can use the machines and the computers and all what you need within the within the eth Ob of course you have to pay something for it uh, but not too much um yeah but that's that's a big help and the ETH doesn't ask you for much so ETH doesn't have any any it's not a shareholder of our company um yeah but on the other hand would actually support us in terms of legal legal questions and so on so i'm, I'm not sure i i've never been uh, supported by a company so i don't know how you would compare that, but actually the feeling for us is, uh, but maybe Johannes can can continue this. The feeling for us is that it's quite a loose, a loose uh, framework to work within, which is great for us because we have a lot of freedom. Yeah, thank you for the insight. I think we've got a good idea. Uh, Johannes, did you want to contribute something? I just wanted to add that in in our case it is quite loose, but I think if you develop something at the ETH. Um, for example, in biotechnology, something, yeah, a concrete element which is going to be sold afterwards with a spin off, then uh, ETH has um, kind of shares as well. But in our case, it is, um, it is that somehow only the, the workflow, how we um, use technology. Um, was the basic to, to build the spin-off. So it's not a concrete product we transformed from, transferred from ETH to its um, Marcus, could I just ask you like, what is your relationship with Trimble? Uh, that's a very good question. So just uh, for, for, other, for other startups in foreign roles uh, where I was not with Building Point, you can't compare what Matthias and Johannes have with normal, um, with when you have a venture capitalist behind you, because then you have to deliver all three months, uh, figures, figures, figures. If you don't deliver, they cash in uh, money. So it's very interesting as a, as a fire business angel or something to get stocks if they don't perform. But I think what uh, your, Matthias and Johannes have is, a, is a, for a long-term, uh, much uh, much better. Uh, our relation to Trimble is they're our partner basically. Uh, they are uh, 
they don't have financial interest in us actually uh, we are just distributor um, we obviously work very closely with them uh, when, it, when we get to new products when with customer feedback and stuff like that but um, they are the guys that ultimately create the products and we enable them here in Switzerland from, from an eagle view perspective so we work with them um, we are not Trimble. Um, we are uh, here in Switzerland. Uh, our customers are um, here in Switzerland and not globally. Obviously, we take advantage from global innovations that uh, help our customers to be more competitive. OK, thank you very much for the answer. I would have, um, again, one more for you, Marcus, um, which is that I think nowadays we are sort of in this in-between state where a lot of um, offices, architectural offices, are still working with the cut-based drawing and more and more are now moving into BIM and it's more and more required for competitions as well. And I'm interested in um, like how do you try or how do you see um, how could some of the advantages that like line-based drawing, for instance, that it's like um, very adaptable. I know that in BIM, you sometimes have to choose from certain catalogs of products that you can use. How, how do you make sure that some of the advantages that you have in CAD right now uh, can also be used in BIM? I think the mainly also from an architectural point of view, uh, this this whole this initial sketching um, sketching time I would call it like that where we, where we use the the pens where we draw the ideas on a, on a board that is almost impossible to bring to to a computer that's does it, in German it's it's the word haptic uh, and computers don't have that even the the best touch screens they like this. The, the haptic, huh? the, this feel for 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 um, for the conceptual side of things, and I think SketchUp did a very good job in somehow getting that 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 feeling uh, to a computer. Uh, but that phase, this whole initial phase, very challenging. Obviously, what a, what a com computers can help in that phase is to 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 benchmark ideas like. Um, um, is a uh, shop the uh, shadow calculation stuff like that from a conceptual point of view and drawings will never go away for certain use cases so you will always have to, we will always have drawings it's just a question which drawings will we have and i fairly believe we will not have the same drawings in five years uh, by from now uh, we will dramatically reduce them but they're where drawings make sense. And I'm talking really about taking pen and paper. We will do it, but we will not do it for revisioning control documents, for example. We will do that in the model in the future. So everything that is process critical will and has to go to models at some point. But uh, the whole architectural thinking process that will, from my point of view, will always be a mix of um, using pen and paper, uh, using models, uh, creating mockups, printing them on a 3D printer, that hard for me to imagine how that uh, can or shall melt. Maybe we will have paper screens, then we can have the discussion again. But uh, at the moment, these glass screens, I don't see it melt at the moment. Maybe in five years, we will have different screen technologies um, that give back this the haptic, the haptic um, that we are used to. Okay, following on what you just said, I mean, this has a huge influence on how we do architecture now or how we work in offices. And also you just, you said before that you save time in planning to invest in a maybe better or just more sustainable building materials. And we were also wondering about how you think the architect's contribution to the building process in general or how our role will change in the future due to this new mm -hmm. technologies? That's a, probably the hardest, hardest question to answer as a whole. Huh? Architects, uh, it depends on the country, right? Uh, in Switzerland, architects uh, have a very strong authority on the building. In other companies, they do, do the concept and they're out of the game. Like if you go to Denmark, yeah, they don't do anything downstream. They, they do the concept and then they're out. I don't think that that is a good vision because um, then it's just about speed, 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 and not about um, 
how does the, the building look and feel at the end of the day? I think there are mainly two roles uh, where architects uh, will evolve in the future. It's, we will always have concept uh, concept architects that are that know how to figure out the the, the, the volume, etc. And then we will have the execution architects. So the function of coordinating all the trades, uh, bring bring them all together. Uh, that will also stay there. What will change there, from my point of view, is that the architect will not figure out every detail. Like uh, when we were drafting, we drafted one to five details, stuff like that, just to find out that there's not even a product on the market that actually replies to that need. Um, so that just drives cost dramatically. And I think he will become more a building manager when it goes down to execution, where um, the people that actually execute bring their bring their stuff and he aligns them at the end of the day. Obviously, digitalization gives whole new possibilities to prefabrication, et cetera, et cetera. I'm thinking not going to open that, but um, it's very important to understand um, in which chain of the life cycle of a building uh, you will want to make your footprints in the future, because all over, very challenging in the future. Okay, thank you for the answer. I have, would have um, the last question. Okay, so the last question would be for Scan Vision again, um, which is that um, your way, your work is like very much enriched by this overlapping of different technologies, right? There's like laser scanning, photogrammetry, and also um, audio recordings, and they sort of um, form a unique new result through this overlapping. And I was um, would be interesting to ask, um, could you think about more layers to add to that or to shift layers or to, yeah, to do this to something else maybe? Um, I'm asking Matthias and Johannes. Um, sorry. Yes, we know. We usually don't know who, who to start. Usually then Matthias take, takes over and I take over. Actually, we did uh, one proof concept to a model in which we we tried to use uh, moving um, people, point cloud people, and even talking. And um, on the other hand, try to to give an overview of different states of of the construction sites in in a in a one take uh, movie scene how is it called um, um there is this this famous movie from russia okay there is just one camera take and actually we wanted to prove prove this this concept and uh, it was quite fascinating but still uh, we have to work work on on these these um new elements to, to integrate but maybe Matthias has the, the movie. The maybe you meant uh, Tarkovsky. Yes, yeah. no. So I don't know. Okay. Um, yeah, it's a it's an interesting question. Um, maybe the main thing that we are working on currently, in terms of what we can add to this kind of relationship of sound as a, of audio visual media, let's say point clouds and sound, is that we are actually working on the the very end of the perception so how how a observer actually sees and perceives it so that's why we are working a lot on interactive applications now um, the question of virtual reality of augmented reality all these things are quite present currently um, in our company so the question how is really how can we really design also the direct perception of something so not just a so not just model the, or let's not just create the model and create the sound atmosphere, but also the access to this. Um, so that's maybe a layer that we are really um, working on. Um, but I'm not sure if you meant this or maybe if you meant some, some other layers. I, I mean, for us, it's the question, for example, whether we can implement the classic 3D model comes up very often. It's obviously something we could do, but that's not something we want to do. Um, just because for us, the point cloud is actually like, uh, it's already a visual media that we want to work with and which has a lot of um, possibilities for us. 
and so we keep it we keep it that way in terms of it's like if you ask a photographer whether he would uh, photoshop something in it that's not photorealistic but something else um so yeah i guess the question of of the of the access is still very open for us and that's what we are very working on thank you very much uh, we've run out of time it was really a great conversation and it was also really great i know it was truncated but to see the work that both of your groups are doing it was very inspiring it also it's a bit confusing as an architect to locate oneself in this world of incredible three-dimensional description but it's inspiring more than confusing i think so thank you very much thank you for the opportunity it was great thank you thank you mm -hmm.